like to start to go from general to specific. Uh, what are the problems and then what are the solutions? So, so both of you uh, think about uh, uh, just generally where are we in higher education, in science, in society in general. Uh, feel free to touch on freedom of speech, academic freedom, the political monoculture, uh, indoctrination in lieu of education, the abandonment of meritocracy, censorship, and whether to blame bureaucracies, leaders, faculty, students, and government. Touch on problems in K-12 education, college, professional schools, law, medicine, and business, science journals, professional societies, the philanthropic universe that supports us, civil society in general. In three and, minutes. And federal government, yeah. both in regulatory and research sponsorship. Now, I meant this as a list of things to choose from. <laughs> when you go to a smorgasbord, do not take one of each, or you will end up too full. But certainly, your views on, on where, what, what kinds of problems you can tell us about that we don't already know about, not all of them, some of them. Uh, <laughs> why, why, why don't you start, Keith? Um, so, I mean, I think there are lots of challenges uh, in higher education. Um, on the upside, though, we're starting from a baseline of really extraordinary institutions, uh, I think not only in the United States, uh, but relative to the world uh, more generally. And so, um, part of my concern is that we may be able to preserve and maintain uh, American universities as really being uh, these kind of world-class institutions, centers of learning and research um, uh, for the world um, at large. And I do worry that some of the things we are confronting now um, really are undermining uh, those achievements of the past and are going to make it more difficult to sustain them um, in the future. Um, certainly some of the issues you just mentioned are, I think, very serious ones um, on university campuses. There is um, a real pressure um, on freedom of speech and intellectual inquiry um, on campuses, and unfortunately, uh, that pressure comes from lots of different directions, um, and so, and, and moreover, it spreads across the entire uh, university. There was a time, uh, I think, when lots of people in natural sciences and engineering uh, thought they were immune from some of these uh, things, and that academic freedom kinds of concerns, free speech concerns, really these weird things that were happening over in the humanities didn't have anything to do with other parts of the campus and could be, so it could be safely ignored. That's just not true anymore. Um, instead, we're seeing these same pressures all across the university, all components of the university, trying to shut down the scope of inquiry people engage in, uh, trying to restrict the kind of speech and the ideas uh, people can explore. Um, and it's a, a deep and serious threat um, to the operation of universities um, if we continue going down uh, that road. Um, and moreover, one of the threats that I've been warning people for quite some time, I think we're now seeing, I have to say, happened on a faster timeline than I expected, we're seeing a public backlash um, uh, to some of what's happening on university campuses. In order to sustain not only our internal mission of being able to engage in free inquiry, we need to protect ourselves from these kind of forces, but also in order to maintain public confidence uh, in what it is universities um, are doing. Um, uh, it's critical that we engage in the core enterprise that we're supposed to be engaged in, uh, which is one of free exploration um, of ideas. It's hard for universities to defend themselves that this is what they ought to be doing if they, in fact, are not practicing it internally. Um, I see lots of people um, outside of universities um, or um, uh, seeing what's happening in universities, don't like it, um, and sometimes in a pretty ham-handed way, I think, uh, trying to intervene. Uh, but that kind of backlash, I think, could be anticipated, um, and really we should have done much more to avoid it. We have to clean up our own house if we're going to make an effective uh, response uh, to these kind of concerns. Um, and unfortunately, I don't see us cleaning up our own house um, uh, quite yet. Um, uh, Chris is very much on the pointy end of the sphere of that backlash. Um, uh, some of the ideas I think that he has advocated, I'm quite supportive of. I think others um, are much more troubling as to how they're being um, implemented. Um, but I think universities have to take that seriously, not only in the sense of taking it seriously and that these pose real challenges for university, but also take it seriously in the sense of people are genuinely concerned about what's happening in universities. And it doesn't make any sense for the, those of us inside the university to stick our heads in the sand and pretend like everything's fine um, when it's clearly not. Um, we need to be addressing those concerns inside in order to be able to make the public case uh, that these are institutions worth defending um, and worth defending in a particular kind of way. Um, so let me stop there, though, because I know there's lots of uh, details in that, and I wanted to unpack those. Um, but, um, but let me well, let me promise you both, we'll get to the fix question <laughs> and the backlash. Sure. Uh, but uh, let, let's let's stay on the nature of the problem, uh, specific problems, and that you notice that are, are particularly uh, particularly troublesome, and, and where you think we really ought to focus our efforts. Uh, Chris, Chris, go for it. And, yeah. And you know, I'll give you a chance. We'll yeah. go back and forth. I, mean, I, I think the problem in universities is the same as the problem in all of our other institutions. And the problem was really revealed in the summer of 2020. 
All of a sudden, everything from you know, Coca-Cola to, to, to Stanford to, uh, um, to your K through 12 administrators all suddenly revealed this narrative that I think uh, exposed a degree of ideological capture that took many people by surprise. Um, it was BLM, kind of BLM ideology, and then it was gender the last you know, year, 18 months you're seeing. And I think most Americans are looking around and saying, wait a minute, what is the purpose of our institutions? Um, and, and I think, of course, you know, Keith is right. American universities have been uh, 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 you know, the best in the world for many years. But I think we're spending down that inheritance and really squandering that inheritance, burning that prestige. And I think in many cases, uh, the people who are working within the universities, you know, especially in kind of DEI bureaucracies, um, don't deserve that prestige. And the degradation of that prestige is very much well earned. And you have what I think is really a crisis of the purpose of the university. Um, you know, you look at like commencement addresses. I was reading a commencement address from UC Berkeley, and it says, okay, this is a good opportunity to tell students what is the purpose of the education, what is the, what is the telos of the university, what are we shooting towards in this free and open inquiry. And you got a sense that there's no purpose beyond platitudes about, you know, diversity is our strength and we're going for equity and social justice. Um, with language that's equivalent to any other institution, could be a marketing firm or a PR agency or, or your, your, your kid's uh, you know, local school superintendent. And I think a lot of the debate that we're, and we'll get into this more, is, is you know, the kind of traditional debate about academic freedom, freedom of speech is totally misplaced. I, I think that's a surface level phenomenon um, organizations like the FIRE, I think, you know, are, are, are fighting this very surface level debate that are missing the deeper institutional and cultural problems. Okay, yeah, you can defend a professor who says something naughty or file a lawsuit, that's great, probably should be done. But you're ignoring the fact that we have a much deeper cultural problem that I'll summarize very quickly. I was talking to a, a professor in the UK. I spent the last six weeks uh, in, in Budapest, Hungary, talking to a professor who's a uh, uh, a professor in the UK, but grew up in Hungary. He's a Hungarian, you know, British uh, uh, academic. And he said, Chris, the, the real problem is that when I grew up under Soviet communism in Hungary, we were more free to speak our minds than I am today in a British university. And so this is not just a legal or technical problem. This is a cultural rot. Um, that, that, that is much deeper. You have faculty imbalances, you have hiring problems, you have management problems, bureaucratic problems. We're trying to, 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 to really fix those in, in Florida and the public universities. Um, but I, I hope that we can really delve into that today, talking about the, the, the deeper nature of this crisis of, of purpose in our, in our higher education institutions. So this, I think you've teed up the big issue, which I'll, I'll go to Keith next on but really is the issue simply one of academic freedom uh, or is the issue one of a deeper culture? All, all of the dissenters are gone uh, or aged out <laughs> of, the, uh, of the faculty, certainly gone from the students and 100% gone from the bureaucrats. So simply freedom to dissent is, is no longer enough uh, against this cultural um, juggernaut uh, I don't know if it's just cultural, cultural political juggernaut that has already taken over so much of higher education. Keith, I, I presume you're going to go on freedoms enough, but uh, <laughs> where are you on this balance? So I think there's a very uh, tight connection between academic freedom, campus free speech kind of worries, and underlying commitment to the mission of what a university is. And, and I think um, it's right that in some ways the academic freedom uh, fights that occur on college campuses are to some degree uh, a function of the corruption and loss um, of the underlying uh, mission, and these are the symptoms uh, from that um, underlying uh, loss. Part of that is I think that there is a real uh, skepticism and doubt um, on university campuses themselves um, about the value of free inquiry and intellectual inquiry uh, more generally. Um, there are many on university campuses that don't see that as the primary mission of the university. They see something else as being the primary mission. They're often skeptical of that goal uh, of free inquiry and truth seeking um, on college campuses. Um, and once you undermine that as the core thing that universities are supposed to be doing, uh, a lot of things uh, follow from that, and including um, uh, the dismantling of protections for academic freedom and free speech um, at the end of the day. 
um, if the primary goal of a university campus um, is to make students really happy, uh, to bring in lots of students and give them diplomas pretty easily, don't challenge them uh, too much, um, uh, then one thing you don't need um, on that college campus um, is much in the way of protections for academic freedom. Um, and so part of, I think, the collapse um, of those protections, the collapse of a willingness to defend those protections um, on university campus is reflective of the fact that there's an underlying lot and disagreement um, and contestation um, about what the purpose of a university is um, in the first place. And so I think there is a fundamental battle that has to be won um, about trying to reestablish what the goal of a university is. Um, and if we can successfully do that, it will have implications for things like academic freedom. I think ultimately, though, it's worth fighting on both fronts. It's, both, it's worth fighting in those specific cases, the specific battles um, where people are not being protected uh, for their speech. But part of that means explaining why it's important uh, to defend those people and defend that kind of speech. And then we also have to try to shore up uh, the mission of the university more generally. I would say just one thing, one final thing about that is that I think this is a broad concern about universities and how they're operating now. On the other hand, and it's pervasive across the university. On the other hand, I don't think it's pervasive across all the people in a university. Um, I think some of what we're uh, faced with um, are relatively small but very active numbers of people on college campuses uh, that really do want to shift uh, what those universities are doing, really do want to close down uh, political debate in, in other ways, uh, whereas lots of people on university campuses just want to put their head down and get their work done. Uh, they believe in their scholarship, they believe in their teaching, and they want to do that uh, in the easiest way possible. And sometimes that just means keeping your head down, uh, avoiding these kinds of conflicts. And so I don't think that universities um, are completely overwhelmed with that. There's a audience there and a set of allies there who can help defend the core mission of the university. We haven't lost that yet. Um, but there is, I think, a minority of activists, um, both among faculty, administrators, and students, um, who simply don't believe in that mission, don't believe the things that follow from that mission. Um, and those people, I think, we really have to push back on very hard. Oh, do you want to follow yeah, up? Yeah, and then I, I have a question for you. Part of the problem, though, that, I, that I've seen is, is, again, that there's a kind of libertarian uh, style, um, what I think is almost a retreat. It's a defense of academic freedom uh, as a pro on procedural grounds. But it's also a defense on academic freedom and free speech without explaining what the purpose of those things are. The goal of the university is not free inquiry. Free inquiry is a method towards some other goal. And so traditionally, you'd have liberal education coming from the Latin liber, meaning uh, you're educating the free citizen. You're pursuing truth, goodness, and beauty. And that's the kind of language that I think we need to start bringing. We can't just have this libertarian half measure to defend the, the process, to, it, you end up defending what I think is a, almost a phantom freedom um, that, that doesn't have any substance. So you have, you're defending a kind of an efficient cause, but not a final cause. And so I, I think what is most exciting to me um, is to start reinvigorating those questions of purpose, the question of the mission. And of course, in the you know, medieval universities, the beginning of the modern universities, it was oriented towards a, a kind of theological high point. Today we have secular universities, public universities, that I think still can be oriented towards some higher purpose. Because what happens is that if you're just defending yourselves on a procedural value system, the left has you know, a better vision. Because the left, you know, for all of their flaws, for all of the kind of, kind of suppressive and repressive cultural uh, attitudes and institutions that they'd like to bring in, at least they say we're fighting for social justice. Um, and in, 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 a, in a contest between someone who's fighting for a, a procedural value and then fighting for a really substantive final value, I think the libertarian style defense of neutral institutions, which of course is total nonsense, um, will never win against someone that is saying, we're fighting for justice. And so conservatives have to, say, have, to have a competing vision of justice, a competing vision of what the university is for. And until we can do that, we can win all the lawsuits uh, that we want, but we're not going to have universities that are then reoriented away from a, what has become kind of a bureaucratic social justice mentality um, that, that we cannot replace uh, um, unless we come up with something that is better, something that is more attractive, something that inspires um, not just you know, leadership or trustees, but you know, students and faculty and staff as well. So, oh, a, a quick question to both of you. Um, uh, so I'm going to push back on, in both directions. Uh, in Please, some sense, yeah. the, the, uh, the um, old, isn't meritocracy the, the value that used to at least defend the way we did things in this brief era from about 1950 until three years ago when meritocracy 
was uh, the way we ran things. It, it, yeah, but again, I think meritocracy is insufficient. Meritocracy for what? I mean, I agree, you should have the, the smartest, most competitive, most accomplished students that are, that are rewarded. This is something that comes from Jefferson. He talked about an aristocracy of talent, um, you know, as he was established in the University of Virginia. I think that is absolutely right. But you also have to say, well, what were the values towards which these institutions were, 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 were pointing? And so, uh, again, you know, neutrality, myth. Neutrality was, was kind of a, a, nice, a, nice, a nice move in the 1950s. Hey, we're gonna have neutral institutions. Uh, a, a, a kind of, it's been exposed, I think, as a myth from both sides. Neutrality, meritocracy, uh, academic freedom, freedom of speech. I think all of those are, are, are useful tools. Um, but, but tools for what is the question that has really been disappeared. And I, I actually don't blame the, the left on this. I blame all of our friends on the right um, who have bought into many of these myths and felt like they could defend themselves solely on the basis of these tools. Well, guess what? You can't. Um, because, again, you can win a lawsuit, but if you have a situation, and all of us in this room probably know many people, of young professors in elite universities or public universities that are you know, closeted conservatives. Uh, they can't speak their mind. They do things they don't believe in. I have many friends uh, uh, that you know, could not take a picture with me publicly because it would be the end of their academic careers. Um, and they are living what is, in a sense, a double life. Um, worse than, uh, again, talking to Hungarian professors under communism, the Hungarians would say, you know, Chris, we lived under the Soviets. And for the first 15 minutes of all of our lectures, we'd have to teach you know, kind of orthodox Soviet thought. But then what we would do is we'd say to the students, would you like to explore something else? And we would take out Aristotle, we would take out Aquinas, we would take out the other books, and we would really study the things that mattered. Studied our, our Hungarian national identity, study the great classics of Western civilization. And in a kind of uneasy way, the, the Soviets and the administrators would kind of wink to us, say, you know, don't, don't be too obvious about it, but that's fine. That's actually preferable uh, in many ways uh, and more open and more free than what we have today. I think all of us know that. And, and, and the more that we can surface that, the more that we can politicize that, the more that we can fight that, and then the more that these, this backlash that is uh, growing uh, should grow, grow, grow more, the more that we can just lay siege to these institutions. Um, I, I think that's going to be how we're going to have to do it. We can't ask for permission. We can't ask to be treated nicely. We can't uh, appeal to dead, a dead set of values. We have to have enough power where we command respect. Uh, and I think that's the way forward. David, um, we need the institutions to work, not just discuss whether meritocracy or some other criterion is how you were admitted to that elite institution. Let me, uh, Keith, I'm going to push back on you a little bit. <laughs> so I'm going to channel my inner Chris mm -hmm. Rufo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ac academic freedom uh, is one thing that those of us who want to pursue unconventional ideas, it, it's one way of stopping the left from shutting us down, or, the, or whatever you want to call the, the powers that uh, on the dark side here. Uh, one tool that they have is to fire you, to censor you, and shut you down. Your freedom to do what you want is one, one tiny way to let, let Pandora out of the box and speak. But they have so many more. Uh, they can cut your salary. They can cut your research funding. They can refuse to publish your papers. They can uh, assign you 10 classes of you know, whatever. Uh, it's, it's so I think I'm channeling Chris. It's not enough to simply preserve your right to say something squeak, squeak, squeak uh, as, as, they, as they strangle you. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Um, I mean, the academic freedom principles, as they are mostly, uh, one, uh, advocated for by um, uh, organizations that care about it, as they're built into professional norms, as they're built into university uh, contracts um, and governing documents, um, has a very narrow set of problems it was trying to address. Uh, these emerged out of the early 20th century. The primary concern uh, was the university presidents and board trustees would fire faculty um, who disagreed with them um, on various things. If students complained about what was happening in your classroom, a president would fire the faculty member uh, for um, offending the students uh, under those circumstances. And so these traditional academic freedom principles were really designed to be able to say, um, we shouldn't have board trustees and presidents being able to 
to fire faculty uh, simply for doing their jobs properly. Uh, so the goal is to protect you to do, be able to, to engage in uh, and talk about controversial ideas without fear of reprisal from the university in the form of being fired. Um, but as we know, right, there's lots of other tools that can be used in universities uh, that can make life very difficult uh, for people who want to dissent or talk about controversial ideas um, that um, are um, short of or different than uh, the problem of the university presidents uh, fi simply firing people. Um, some of the ones are the ones you mentioned, right, that they can uh, not give you raises, they can give you more teaching. Uh, and other kind of things that just make your job um, uh, more miserable than it might otherwise be. Um, but it's also the case that they can do things like uh, not hire you in the first place. Um, they can do things like refuse to publish your work, uh, not because the university president is going to censor it, which is very much uh, what the AUP was worried about in the early 20th century, the university presidents simply saying, you're not allowed to publish that scholarship uh, because we have a donor who won't like it. Um, and so the university president trying to censor the work. Instead, what we have now is situations where faculty activists all across the disciplines uh, refuse to allow you to come to a scholarly conference in order to talk about certain ideas. They refuse to allow you to publish work in scholarly journals uh, that talk about certain ideas. It is an um, uh, abandonment and a treason uh, to the core uh, goals and ideals of what universities um, are about. And traditional academic freedom principles were not designed to address those or solve them. Um, and they're hard to solve. They can't be solved simply through contractual commitments between universities um, and their faculty. They have to be solved by cultural change. They have to be solved uh, by um, agitating on the other side um, inside these scholarly venues uh, in order to try to push back against those um, who want to um, close those venues down and not be willing to explore um, ideas in the future. I think Chris is right that it matters as to why you're doing that. Um, I'm much more libertarian about how I think about these things, but I think he's very right um, that people have a hard time committing themselves to purely procedural ideas if they don't see what substantive goals you're trying to advance. Um, I think there are substantive goals that Free Inquiry is trying to solve, um, and it might be worth unpacking that a little more. I suspect Chris and I have some disagreements about what that looks like exactly. Um, but at the end of the day, it's hard to persuade people that they should listen to people that they think are fundamentally wrong uh, and maybe even evil. Um, and uh, that's, that's a tough sell um, for a lot of people in a lot of contexts. And unfortunately, it's a very tough sell for faculty even um, at this uh, point in the game. And so part of that is convincing people and explaining to people why it's valuable and important um, that you tolerate that, um, even if you uh, don't see the immediate payoff uh, for doing so. I just wanted to add, yeah. you said people are, are, are not admitted to academic conferences for yeah. unpopular scientific views. They are also canceled out of scientific conferences for their, uh, for their personal or political yes. views. Mm. Uh, for example, you can be canceled out of a geophysics conference because you wrote an op-ed about, uh, about uh, DEI bureaucracy. Yeah. Well, let me get to the thing I know we're dying to. Uh, <laughs> we can't put this all along. Models for fixing it. Uh, and there are lots of ways we can think about fixing it. So I, I'm going to ask Chris first because that's sort of what he's, he's been out on the ramparts uh, in the way that the rest of us, uh, well, you've been out on the ramparts too, but Chris has Different been out ramparts. on the ramparts <laughs> where they're, where they're uh, yeah, the, uh, I guess the, uh, the arrows are, are flying fast and furious. So, so tell us some of what you've been doing with uh, Governor DeSantis, uh, both at the, uh, at the new university and some of your other reforms. Um, New college, how's it going? Sure, yeah. Um, and I'll follow up with, uh, you know, legislatures and other ways that people who don't like this can push back. So tell us about New College. Yeah, I, I've been working on this issue, these set of issues uh, this year. It's going to be my big focus. And there are uh, a few component parts. You know, first is the uh, legislative component. Um, I've put out uh, uh, model legislation, and I've supported it with some journalistic work and investigative work um, to abolish DEI bureaucracies in every state university. Um, Florida and Texas, it's going quite well. I'm going to start really hammering Texas. Um, I started hammering yesterday. We're going to hammer a little harder um, in the coming weeks as legislators start to, to convene to consider these bills. Um, so there's that side of it. And then New College is really a, a, a special experiment. Um, and what happened uh, at the beginning of the year was uh, Governor DeSantis appointed a new slate uh, of, of conservative trustees that we now have the majority of the, of the board. And we were given a mission to transform this uh, unfortunately failing, uh, very far left-wing public university um, into a model for classical liberal arts education. And so um, as I read the history, uh, the, 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 the left has, done, has successfully executed their long march to the institutions since the late 1960s. 
with no successful counter-revolutionary actions or measures. Um, I, I, maybe there are some. I, I haven't found any. haven't talked to anyone that has. And so in, in my view, um, and we kind of telegraphed this uh, publicly to the New York Times and elsewhere, is saying this is going to be hopefully a first step, a first time initiative to recapture an institution. Um, and what we've done since January is we, uh, we fired the president. Um, the provost uh, uh, stepped down uh, uh, after some uh, very public fights uh, with me and others. Um, we abolished the DEI bureaucracy. Uh, we fired the DEI leader. Um, we are going to be reorganizing the academic programs. We're going to be bringing in a new curriculum, hiring new faculty, um, and then recruiting, I think, a, 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 a students uh, from, from Florida and across the country that are inspired by this vision of restoring a classical liberal arts education. Um, and so it's really a question of, of, of governance. And I think the big problem is that um, what's happened in, in, in many universities is that uh, governance has been, I think, delegated too much to, to, to faculty, uh, frankly. Uh, no offense to faculty in the room. Um, um, you guys are not great at institutional governance. Um, uh, and, and then what happens is that you have faculty running the show. They create kind of a, a, a pipeline for new faculty. They all agree. Um, and then you have um, uh, these really lopsided institutions. And then what you have is administrators that are weak. And I hate to say it, but a lot of these academic leaders are just temperamentally weak people. I mean, if we're going to be really blunt and honest about it. And so they cave instantly to any kind of pressure, any kind of m emotional or social manipulation. And so what you have is the, um, the kind of, the, the whole institution just, just shifts, just turns. And so what we're trying to do is reestablish authority, reestablish standards, reestablish limits, um, and then reestablish a, 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 hopefully an institution that is oriented towards those, um, those timeless uh, values and, and pursuit of truth. So um, I think so far it's going very well. Uh, it's been, been a bit dramatic. Uh, there have been some, some ups and downs. Uh, but I think in the next two to three years, we're going to see a, a dramatic turnaround. And I know for a fact that there's a huge demand for this kind of education. Hillsdale College, which is in a very unenviable uh, uh, rural area in the middle of very cold Michigan, um, has, I, I think they have their admissions rate uh, down to like, you know, the teens, like 13, 14 percent. Uh, they have very high yield. Students want to go to Hillsdale. Um, and so, um, I think we're seeing, especially conservative parents saying, you know, I want to have an option to send my kids that it's going to be good education. And so I, I think it's a big growth opportunity. So I, I'm going to promise you both, we'll get to the legislation part later. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but for now, let's talk about uh, new ins taking, recapturing institutions, creating new institutions like the university at Austin, uh, creating new schools and centers within the institutions as Purdue and Virginia and others are doing. Uh, can we can we rebuild or recapture uh, the existing institutions? And what do you think of this notion that there's too much faculty governance? I, I think there's too much administrator governance <laughs> and not enough leader governance and not enough broader governance. There's no board of directors that trustees are I just agree. I agree with all that. That's okay. Because yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very worried about just giving more, as much as faculty tend to make things, giving the administrators more, <laughs> more power does not seem to me like a good idea. And I'm, I'm intruding on what you should be saying, so go for it. So I, so I also want to endorse that last point uh, in particular. So now I was struck by the way Chris framed it, although I understand why you framed it that way, but I do think uh, part of what's happened in universities is a significant decline um, in faculty governance over the last uh, many decades, um, with a rise of an expansive administrative class um, that uh, controls a tremendous amount of what the university actually does uh, in practice. Faculty uh, not only uh, do a relatively small set of the things uh, the universities uh, do these days, um, but they also control and govern a relatively small set of things uh, that uh, universities uh, do uh, these days. Um, and partially, as a consequence of that, what I'm particularly concerned about with universities is the part um, the faculty um, are most interested in and care most about, which is fundamentally the educational research and scholarly mission um, of the university. Um, I think there's been a lot of administrative bloat uh, that can quite reasonably uh, be cut back um, in universities, and there's certainly a lot of administrative control over what universities operate, as what universities do, and sometimes that extends into the scholarly side um, of universities, and I think, in fact, that has to be um, resisted, and some of the DEI bureaucracy, unfortunately, um, has been part of that administrative class uh, that has interfered with 
uh, the scholarly and research activities um, on university campuses and need to be resisted um, as, a, as a consequence. Um, on the other hand, I do think that the core academic mission of the university and the core features of that academic mission do need to be under the control of faculty. I don't particularly want to see board trustees, for example, trying to design the curriculum. I don't need uh, amateur boards of trustees uh, to be making uh, detailed personnel decisions about which faculty um, they ought to be hired. I think that's a bad path for universities to go down. Uh, it's not going to be healthy for those institutions in the long run. Um, if that's the direction we go, although there may be some real temptations uh, to do it um, in the short run. So I think maintaining and preserving uh, faculty governance, especially over core um, academic features of the university, um, are quite crucial. I also think that there are some opportunities here. So I think that um, adding to universities, building with universities, um, is uh, what we ought to be doing uh, broadly to try to um, improve the situation. It's not the only thing we ought to be doing, but certainly part of it. Um, I am hopeful that the University of Austin um, uh, becomes um, uh, a good um, alternative institution. I'm a little skeptical they'll be successful in being able to do that, but I like seeing people uh, try to innovate and explore new opportunities. Uh, there's lots of nice innovations that are occurring um, on uh, university campuses now, many of them modeled actually on my colleague Robert George's uh, James Madison program um, at Princeton, uh, which tried to carve out a place within Princeton University um, to host a set of ideals committed, a set of um, activities committed to American ideals institutions. This has been a good model that other places, including the Hamilton Center uh, down at the University of Florida, the Civitas Institute at the University of Texas, are now trying to um, both uh, model themselves on to some degree, but also expand out uh, what they're going to do uh, within those institutions. Um, I think those are important initiatives. They may not all be uh, completely successful, um, but I think they're good additions um, to what universities ought to be doing. They have some real promise um, as to what we can accomplish down the road. I want to ask you, uh, this, this is the central problem here. <clears throat> who, who governs, who takes yes. the power? Uh, we have this massive administrative bloat, uh, so giving it to them isn't a good idea. Faculty, I, I'm, I'm a little bit with Keith. Uh, as, as even though the faculty tends to be a political monoculture, uh, a colleague who used to work at Oxford <clears throat> told me that uh, faculty used to read admissions files. Yeah. And that struck me. No American university <laughs> faculty touch, is allowed to touch an admissions <laughs> file. Yet they complain. All my students are social justice warriors who don't know any math. Uh, none of them want to work hard. And, and, and well, why don't you get off your butts and read some admissions files, or at least in the faculty senate, take control over the admissions. So, Handing things, I, I'm like, as an ex-faculty, yeah. I'm kind of, yeah, maybe faculty, but I'm the, I'm the faculty. The, the leaders, of course, know how to circumvent all sorts of things. It sounds like you've taken the legal structure of a state school, which yeah. has a much more powerful, that's like the board of directors, which is sort of what's missing in any university. And that can force leaders to accountability can force a reduction, in, in, and that really is where the power is going to force yeah. this change for yeah, you. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, and I should add, I mean, uh, faculty governance, I mean, the administrative governance problems are also real, so I agree with you both there. And, and, and look, faculty delegates uh, to administration and administration delegates to, uh, among, amongst itself, and then what's, what's happened in, in a lot of the public institutions, private institutions are run quite differently, but public institutions is that what you have is, what you have as the status quo is a rubber stamp board. You have successful people in business, you have successful people in politics, you have successful right. people in general. Uh, true, true, but, and then what happens is you meet every quarter, you go out to a nice uh, uh, lunch, you eat a steak, and then you go into the room, you have, you have 600 pages of documents, and then you sign on the dotted line. You're given the program by the, the, the president, the provost, the administration, and there's almost no debate. If you look at the actual votes uh, in boards of directors at public universities, they're almost always unanimous. Um, uh, there's, there's very little um, actual governance. It's treated as a formality, as an honor, and uh, no one wants to rock the boat, even in kind of deep red states, let's say. I think that's a huge problem. I think that, I, I think that uh, boards of directors or boards of governors need to govern. They need to reassert authority. Because we are um, the appointed representatives of the public, and we are the stewards of public money and public institutions that are designed to serve a public good. And so um, trustee governance also should not be spared uh, uh, in our critique. And so what you have is this really awful system of incentives where no one wants to take responsibility, no one wants to take accountability. 
Um, and then the worst impulses are channeled into um, bureaucratic imperatives. Um, and then so what do you do? Um, I think the most uh, appropriate model um, is to say public, the public gets to decide how to govern public institutions. We, we live in a republic. We live in a democratic system. Uh, we elect legislators that are, that are ultimately control the purse strings. We elect a governor and a, you know, and a board of governors in, indirectly who appoint trustees. We actually have to do a, a public service and a public duty, which requires us to be uh, tough, to be strong, to demand accountability, to make changes. Um, and, and these are things that need to come back into the system. And, and I, I really disagree with Keith. Look, the, the principles of the AAUP 1915 and 1940 statement, which have supposedly guided us to academic greatness for 100 years, are exactly the principles that got us into this mess. Be, they failed. They failed to actually protect those institutions. You know, Chicago principles are great. The Calvin statement is great. All these things are great. Uh, and I agree with them, but they've proven insufficient historically to defend these institutions. And so uh, the, the very principles and policies that have failed uh, to, to protect the institutions are not going to be the ones that restore those institutions. They don't have the requisite strength. They don't have the requisite vision. They don't have the requisite political power. And ultimately, we would not like to admit it, but, but these are all political decisions. Um, and I think, uh, in opposition to many of my libertarian friends, the universities are not overly politicized. Um, the universities are overly ideologized and insufficiently politicized. We should repoliticize the universities and understand that the education is at heart a political question. You know, the, the Aristotle's uh, 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 education work is in book eight of the politics. Um, you know, th the point of education is to train citizens for participation in the polis and in, in political life. Uh, and so libertarian conservatives who would want to retreat, um, I, I think, are actually abdicating an enormous responsibility. And one final point, the, again, beating up on libertarian conservatives, I'm so sorry, folks. But the, also the, the libertarian conservatives who say, well, um, you know, we, we, it's, it's very naughty, it's very inappropriate for us to use state power to reform institutions. What are you guys talking about? These are public universities funded by taxpayers. And we have our, we, we, these are not, uh, this is not a free marketplace of ideas. This is a state-run monopoly on education institutions. And we have a duty and responsibility to use political power to shape them towards uh, serving the citizens, towards serving the public good. So I, I sense that we cannot avoid the hard question. Uh, I'll push back on state-run monopoly because there's lots of states and there's there's private uh, things. But but 25 percent of 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 the university system are are public universities. If that was a cable company or an energy company or a, or a phone company, you would consider yeah. it a functional monopoly. And so, so you can't avoid the public problem. Let me tee up the question, and you can hit this one out of the park. We have either public universities, state universities, which are owned and, and subsidized by their state governments. We have private universities like Stanford that receive rivers of federal money to say nothing, the great advantages of the tax deduction for charitable contributions and the fact that our, our uh, endowments don't have to pay taxes. So we, uh, everyone except Hillsdale is, is taking some money. When our political leaders are re uh, reflecting the democratic choices of the voters, change their minds and discover that this is not what they want, what can they do about it? So you have some model legislation and some things going on in Florida. I'll let you describe. I, I, I mean, in a sense, think, we can. And then I'll let Keith say, "No, you crazy." <laughs> that's sure, a terrible. No, I, I mean, in a sense, we can do whatever we want. I mean, that's well, what the, should we do? I, I mean, that's that's. I mean, but that no, they, this is. I mean, it's kind of flippant, but it's actually a really important point. There is an idea that universities are sacrosanct; they should be protected from all intervention. That they're that they're that they're. Um, comes kind of entity different than any other public entity, public universities. That's not true at all. Uh, uh, this is a kind of elaborate mythology that has been spun up, I, I think almost in the same way that the teachers unions have spun up a mythology around, around public K through 12 schools. Um, but, but what legislators are learning very quickly, fortunately, is that, that um, no, they, they, they can be governed uh, in any way. And I think like, look, the idea, the ideal, and, and I, I think this was a good, a good idea, was that, hey, state legislators will delegate responsibility to academic leaders, to faculty and state universities, 
um, allow autonomy, allow self-governance, um, because be, in, in the interest of free inquiry, in the interest of academic excellence, in the interest of, of debate. But my read is that university administrators, faculty, staff um, have really violated their end of the bargain. Because even if you read the AAUP statement from 1940, it says there are academic freedoms but also corresponding responsibilities. It says in the first paragraph that these universities should be oriented towards the common good. It says also faculty should be very careful uh, in the classroom not to bring in extraneous, controversial political opinions, and also should be very careful in their public statements not to be perceived as partisan activists. What, what, ha what has happened is that public universities have, have just adopted race and sex narcissism to such a degree that they want all of the freedoms and none of the responsibilities. In my view, legislators are well within their rights and well within, within the, the, the correct course of action to say, You've broken your end of the bargain, now we're gonna bring accountability. And so I'd like to see uh, 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 deeper, uh, first abolish the DEI offices altogether. Um, I'd like to see um, uh, 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 you know, some of those great, you know, the Calvin principles, the Chicago principles adopted as, 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 part, of that, uh, as part of that university policy in, in statewide. I'd like to see you know, reform on faculty hiring. I mean, we need to have more balance in the universities and the faculty is not gonna self-select uh, balance. We know that, that's a fact. Uh, and I'd like to see boards of trustees uh, taking a good look at the uh, uh, academic departments. I'd like to shut down altogether some of the most activist academic departments that don't contribute towards scholarly knowledge. They take a public subsidy to engage in partisan political activism. Um, I'd like to all the solipsistic uh, uh, and, and, and really narcissistic uh, 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 academic uh, uh, lines of inquiry um, to, to, to be certainly have a First Amendment right to pursue it, but you don't have an entitlement to public funding. Um, we have in, from UC Berkeley, from University of Chicago, we have a precedent for shutting down academic departments that are no longer serving the mission. We should, we should do that at a large scale. Um, and then we should um, you know, try to encourage uh, greater faculty governance, tie funding to having open debate, um, uh, and, and really try to, to reinvigorate a, a multiplicity of perspectives on campus. And I think things like Civitas, things like uh, 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 Hamilton Center are, are part of that uh, process. And then I think also, and this is, let's, let's just go straight for it. I'll, I'll, I'll say my piece and then keep the heads gonna explode. Um, <laughs> look, the boards of trustees should be, should be thinking about what is the purpose and what should a core curriculum look like? Because right now you can go, you go into college, I talk to students uh, about this all the time, you can take a class in the Beatles, you can take a class in your, sexual, in your personal sexuality, you can take a class in whatever, and you get to the end of it and you say, well, what did I actually learn? I learned nothing. Um, and if you go back to the, again, this is the classical liberal arts initiative. They codified the, 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 the quadrivium, the trivium, the seven, the seven uh, liberal arts. Um, 2,000 years of, of the classical liberal arts had a very rigorous progression of studies, a very uh, rigorous requirement of what it takes to be an educated citizen. I think, look, not every university, you're not gonna turn University of Florida overnight into that, but I think we should have experiments, even in public universities, to say, let's have a rigorous uh, a continuation of this great uh, historical tradition. And I view the uh, left liberal and right liberal, liberal, shouldn't even have the word, but I, I view this kind of uh, post-war period as a deviation from the classical liberal arts tradition. And in a ways, I think what I've seen, um, and maybe a controversial point is, the idea was to educate people in freedom, liberal arts, to liberate the person, to have education of a free citizen. So much of the, the academic work, the coursework, um, Aristotle would consider it as an education in servitude. Uh, uh, not, you know, chattel servitude, but a, a servitude of, of the passion, servitude of, of a base uh, and ignoble education. And I think we have to do whatever it takes um, to, to start raising uh, uh, the sights of, of people and, and, and restoring um, that high point of what the purpose of education is for. And there are gonna be a lot of people uh, that have to get, unfortunately, uh, um, uh, ushered into a new career path. So, so, so what, what does it take? You got a bunch of specifics. Uh, we've also talked about legislative bans on critical race theory, about abolishing tenure, which I worry just means uh, the same academic, uh, administrators now get to fire me. Uh, and how do you implement these things with pushback of the powers that be at the current place. I'm just gonna say, go. <laughs> yes, yeah, go. So, uh, 
So certainly, you know, look, if I put my political science uh, hat on, um, uh, which I sometimes do, um, uh, I think it's totally right at, at bottom, right, that state institutions um, are uh, extensions of state governments. And there's going to be some level of political control um, over those organizations. And particularly, um, it's going to be the case that if elected politicians reflecting the will of their own voters um, uh, look at state universities um, and think that they're not uh, pursuing the proper mission, uh, not accomplishing uh, the goal for the public good that they ought to be doing, there's going to be political reprisal of that. There's going to be greater political intervention um, in those universities um, as a consequence. And I think it's also true that um, the AUP has long emphasized from the very beginning um, that there are certain rights that ought to come along with being in academia in order to advance uh, the public good, in order to advance what universities are trying to accomplish. But there are also responsibilities that come along with that as well. Um, and universities have not been very good um, across uh, the 20th century, certainly in the last few decades, um, of emphasizing the responsibility part. Um, and I think it's quite appropriate for boards of trustees um, to push back on that and emphasize as part of their fiduciary duty to make sure these institutions are operating appropriately and accomplishing what they're supposed to be accomplishing, to emphasize that those responsibilities are real um, and faculty ought to adhere to them as well as others um, in the university um, system ought to adhere to them um, as well. So I have no particular objections with the idea that trustees ought to be, ought to be concerned with that. I think the um, question is what's going to be the long-term uh, uh, best interest of universities and ultimately um, of state governments, for example, and the polity more broadly um, uh, through what kind of interventions uh, more generally. So I'm very skeptical of the idea um, that over time trustees are going to be particularly good at designing curriculum, uh, for example, or hiring faculty, um, uh, for example. I think at the end of the day, uh, those kinds of decisions need to be delegated down uh, to faculty. But faculty have to do a good job with them, and frankly, in some cases, perhaps they're not. Um, and then the question is, what do you do about um, those situations uh, more broadly? I don't have strong views about the idea that we ought to have a, a common core curriculum um, in universities um, in general. I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical uh, that that's a, a model that makes sense um, across the board. Um, I'm a product of state institutions. Um, I came out of public schools from K through 12, uh, went to the University of Texas um, as an undergraduate. I went to the University of Texas in part uh, because I was very interested in their engineering program, uh, which they were excellent in, although at the end of the day, I wound up shifting into the business school and doing things in the liberal arts. If you look at people who, are going, who want to be business school majors or engineering majors, the last thing they want to hear is yeah. uh, every university is going to require every student to go through this elaborate liberal arts training. Part of the reason why universities backed off of that um, across the 20th century is precisely because students didn't want it, employers didn't want it, um, it was not clear that it was benefiting uh, people enough, and so there's a place for that kind of liberal arts training, uh, but it shouldn't be as robust as it was in the 19th century when universities were performing a very different um, uh, task. Um, and so maybe there needs to be some tweaking on that. Maybe there are particular institutions that ought to dedicate themselves to that, and there are, mm -hmm. and I think that's all to the good. Um, but there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all model about what uh, universities ought to look like in general. That's true across state universities, certainly true across the entire landscape um, of higher education more generally. Thinking specifically about some of these legislative proposals um, that are on the table, um, not only in Florida, but also elsewhere. I've written quite a few things that are quite critical um, of the bill that's currently moving uh, through the Florida legislature, as well as uh, some of the legislation moving through Texas and some other places. Um, uh, in Texas, for example, um, the Senate um, has just recently voted to get rid of tenure um, going forward at state universities. I think that would be a disaster uh, for state um, higher education um, uh, down the road and would be a terrible idea for how universities universities um, ought to operate. Uh, certainly people like me would be the first ones on the cutting uh, block um, if uh, you got rid of tenure uh, in universities uh, now. It strikes me as very short-sighted um, and ultimately not good for the university in the long term. There's other proposals, for example, that are aimed at DEI bureaucracies, um, DEI statements that are required for faculty hiring and for uh, student admission in universities, for example. I have no objections. Uh, to those. I think they need to be written carefully. Um, a lot of them are not being written very carefully in terms of legislation. Um, but as a goal of what, um, and, and something appropriate even for legislatures and trustees to be doing uh, relative uh, to universities, I think some of that's totally fair game uh, and acceptable. It's just a question of how well uh, do you do it. Um, some of the proposals, though, um, and some of them are separate in these uh, anti critical race theory or divisive concepts bans, for example, are aimed precisely at the classroom. What kind of discussions can you have in the classroom? Potentially, even what kind of research uh, you can do uh, more generally. Um, I think not only are those badly written, 
um, as uh, presented, many of them are unconstitutional. I should note, though, that over time, uh, some of them have been more carefully drafted. Uh, so, for example, the current bill moving through the Texas legislature, better written uh, than the Stop Woke Act was that passed um, Florida legislature um, uh, a year or so ago. Um, so I think there is a learning curve that's occurring in some of these legislatures. Some of the legislatures are improving um, on what they're doing. They're making more modest um, interventions uh, in universities as a consequence. And I tend to think that the more modest and more careful the interventions are, uh, the, generally speaking, the better they are and sometimes even helpful. Yeah, I, I, you know, I actually, I actually pretty much agree with all the things that Keith is saying there. I, I, I would say a couple things. You know, on the critical race theory, I, I think those are most appropriate in K through 12, yeah. and I think that there is, you know, the the, the case law is quite clear. Um, look, a, a kid in a kindergarten classroom uh, is very different than a kid in a college classroom. Uh, I would like even my own children to have a. Uh, uh, predictable and, and limited uh, exposure to the things that they learn in kindergarten. Um, whereas if my kid is in college, like free reign, let it rip. Be in the classroom and, and have a, an aggressive debate, have a wide-ranging debate. Uh, and so the, the, the model legislation that I've uh, worked on with colleagues at Manhattan Institute, the anti-CRT initiatives are limited to K through 12. Um, on tenure, I, 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 you know, I tend to agree, I think that uh, for, for whatever reason, legislators, um, God bless, I love legislators, let's get on the record, I love all legislators, <laughs> um, they're, they're fantastic in every way. But I would say one friendly you know, family uh, maybe criticism is that some legislators have a tendency to then think of the most obvious thing and then say, well, that's the, yeah. the solution. Maybe everyone is this way in a bit. Um, and they say, well, the, the problem is tenured professors. And it's like, well, I mean, yes, many of the tenured professors are a problem. But tenure itself is not a problem. Uh, and, and in fact, actually getting rid of tenure, I think, would, would have negative unintended consequences for folks that are more uh, 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 in line with our views. So I, I think that that is you know, not a priority. Um, but what I think, it, so I, I would say, look, leave the, leave the classroom alone. That's a losing fight uh, for conservatives. And I think even on principle, it's probably not wise to, 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 to meddle too much. Um, because look. The other thing is, if you have a problem with what's happening in the classroom, you've hired the wrong people. Yeah. That's, that's the real thing. The hiring is a big problem, the administration. But I would say where we have really uh, um, legally and constitutionally uh, all, virtually unlimited power is in administration and reforming the administration and governance. And so I, I would say to legislators, again, uh, um, you know, resist the temptation to go for the most obvious uh, first fixes. Um, and then reform governance, reform faculty hiring, abolish DEI, get in very strong uh, leadership, uh, seek a greater balance, uh, hire the right people, and then let them teach. Let them do what they want to do in the classroom. And I, even as a trustee at New College, I have, uh, uh, we have some uh, very spirited, very uh, politically charged left-wing faculty said some very nasty things about me in public. Um, and look, if you were working at a private company and you said something nasty about uh, 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 the board of directors, you'd be out the door with a cardboard box full of your stuff immediately. I think it's fine. It's, it's criticism. Some of it is a little bit ridiculous and overheated. But, but I'm, it's like, I respect that. Let's have the debate. I wouldn't ever, ever say, hey, I'm going to you know, micromanage your, your, your uh, discussions in the classroom. That's a losing battle. No one has time for that. That's not what you should be doing. But what we should be doing is then saying, well, let's take a look at the course offerings. Let's take a look at the sequence of courses. This is, again, a, a liberal arts college that, of course, engineering students should not have to go through Xenophon and, and, and the pre-Socratic uh, physicists. But in a small liberal arts college, uh, they, they, sh they should. Um, and so I, I think we could probably come up with a, a lot of uh, majority positions, looking at administration, looking at hiring, uh, looking at the, the, the general curriculum and course offerings. And I'm hoping, too, at New College that we're going to look at some course offerings and reject some course offerings. Um, I, that should also be a standard, to say your, your course offerings, especially at a small liberal arts school where it's manageable, right? Um, it should go through the provost's office, and then it should have the final stamp of approval from the board of trustees. Um, because look, if you're teaching you know, um, you know, some just absolute trash courses, to be, to be blunt about it, um, they should say they should be rejected on quality grounds, and I think that should be something that we we normalize. And 
probably keep this agreed. So I want to give you a closing statement, and then we're going to open it up for questions and short speeches. Yeah, so that last point um, does raise something that I, that I skipped over earlier relative to uh, something Chris mentioned, which is we're closing down departments, closing down majors, um, uh, maybe closing down individual classes as not being uh, useful or appropriate. Um, and there, I'm much more skeptical about, I think, the board trustees uh, in particular um, uh, have, and, and even presidents of universities more generally, um, of having great insight um, into uh, which uh, majors or which classes um, ought to be killed off because they're not intellectually uh, serious enough. I think there has to be a lot of faculty participation um, in that kind of decision making. Um, that's not to say that existing classes or existing majors or existing uh, departments are all sacrosanct. Um, they aren't. And but, moreover, it's also the case that faculty get entrenched in some of those things. We have institutions that are now designed in this particular way. They've hired me into those. I'd like to preserve this particular department, even though no students are actually taking those classes anymore. They're not serving any useful function. And sometimes that requires a stronger hand from university presidents and maybe even board trustees to step in and address some of those kind of entrenched interest in order to merge and shut down departments in order to make space uh, for being able to do things that are more vibrant in the future. But I that's think never that's been, been true, though. The faculty right, is, yeah. is no incentive right. to shut down academic departments. Uh, they have zero incentive to do that. In fact, they have every incentive not to do that. Well, well, and well, even they, historically, those examples at Berkeley and at, and at University of Chicago and Emory, um, those were all driven by administration. And so I, I, I just think, look, I mean, it doesn't take a, uh, it doesn't take a super genius to, to spot out some of the yeah. academic departments that are low quality, that are uh, highly uh, ideological, and they're oriented towards partisan political activism not towards yeah. truth seeking. It's not hard. We have, I mean, we have visiting it, committees and so forth. I, I want, this yeah. is a good, yeah. okay. we're, we've gotten a narrative. Yeah. Well, I, I want one last question. Is it appropriate for universities, uh, maybe even repurpose their DEI offices, to at least measure political or ideological diversity and, and try to aim for some? I think that would be great. I mean, implementation, obviously, you don't want to be, uh, yep. uh, you, you, you know, you don't want to be uh, uh, you know, invasive. But sure, I think that's, look. We don't even measure it now. You, yeah, universities measure all sorts of things. You look at the institutional research offices at universities. They measure all sorts of things. They run all sorts of studies. I mean, it is telling to me that they're not measuring this. There's a reason that they're not doing it with all the resources that these universities have because it'd be very embarrassing. It's so... The, the, the research from George Mason professors showed that in, in some of the elite liberal arts colleges, you have 20 to 1, 50 to 1, 120 to 0 ratios of liberal to conservative faculty. I mean, that's, that's a, a, just a disgrace. And then on, on students, I mean, you know, I, I think having 50-50 balance on students uh, is probably, students are typically more liberal. I mean, uh, you know, that's fine. But I think in faculty, you, you shouldn't have a situation like at, at, I think at Harvard where it's like 2%. Uh, of faculty are, are, are conservative, something like Can that. A word on that one? Yeah. I've got no patience for the people who want to resist uh, measuring those things, right? I think, in fact, uh, board trustees, institutions, certainly state governments have uh, a genuine interest in knowing uh, what the composition of the faculty is um, on these dimensions. It has potential consequences uh, for those institutions. It's useful for institutional uh, research offices uh, to be finding out the information. I think, again, it has to be done with some care, yeah. um, so it's not done badly. I think the real questions are, what do you do about it once you have the information? And there, I'm very concerned yeah. about what happens next. Um, but I think finding out the information, look, I, th I think universities ought to be truth-seeking institutions. And part of that means knowing what the faculty look like. Know thyself. Um, as part yeah. of that, right? And yeah. so I think that's important. Can I ask the first question, though, because I want to know about yeah. New College, uh, recent board trustee decision uh, to reject uh, tenure um, uh, for uh, a set of faculty who are coming up for tenure. Sure. I've been very interested in sort of the kind of decisions you all are going to make um, as trustees um, so far because you're in the early phases. I haven't had actually a lot of objections um, to what you all have done sure. so, so far. Uh, but that, on the other hand, uh, gave me real pause. And sure. So I'd like to know what the explanation yeah, is so, for that. So, yeah. so, so the, the explanation is, is fairly simple. So. You know, New College was, according to the state uh, metrics, on almost all measures, the lowest performing public university in the state of Florida. Um, it had consistently failed to meet any kind of uh, performance targets. Um, it was at risk. The legislature was so frustrated a, a, a year or two ago, they were seriously considering just shutting down the college altogether. Um, and, uh, and so in that environment, the, the President Corcoran, and then as trustees, we, we voted um, uh, to support his, his recommendation. These were faculty that were coming up uh, for tenure a year early. And so the decision was, 
not, not even necessarily a judgment on, on quality or, 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 or appropriateness of tenure in general. It was simply to say, in an environment of rapid change, in an institution that has been failing to meet every target, we're not going to give, we're not going to be uh, rewarding or bestowing special privileges ahead of the regular schedule. So come up again for tenure next year when the, when the actual uh, 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 tenure schedule um, has, has allocated. So I, I think that, um, I mean, sure, I mean, there, there's maybe a reasonable critique, but it seems to be the, the case that um, uh, I, I think it sets a good precedent. They were also asking for a raise. The faculty was asking for a raise. They say, hey, wait a minute. You are the, the, the lowest performing uh, public university. Um, we're taking you over to avoid all of your positions being liquidated. Now is probably not a good time to give you a raise. I'm sorry. Um, we're going to have some performance, some accountability. And so I, I think that was the decision. And um, uh, I, I think it was a, a tough one, but it was the right one. And it's going to send signals. Um, I, I think to say, hey, look, there is a, a, there's a new boss, um, and uh, it's not just going to be a rubber stamp board that, that, that gives you special treats without uh, a special performance. With that, Josh, you've been waiting patiently. So this has been great. Thanks to both of you for being here. Um, uh, so for two questions, one about public universities and one about private universities. So public universities, for Keith, one, one question I've, I've always been unable to sort of wrap my head around is, what is it that vests faculty, in, in, in your view, with the right to um, have full decision rights over hiring and departments and curriculum, even if it involves indoctrination, in a public university setting where the public university is presumably playing the role of trying to represent the views of the people? You know, I, I really, it, it seems that the role of the Board of Trustees should be to ensure that the university is doing you're performing the will of the people, and therefore that the composition of people, uh, the composition of, of, of people within the university or faculty represents sort of the composition of the people within, within, within the state. And that if they're not doing that, that that's a failure. And it can't be the First Amendment in free speech. It can't be that uh, taxpayers uh, in the state of Florida have to, are, are forced to pay for sociology departments that are indoctrinating uh, college students in things that, they, that just the vast majority don't believe in. That's just a huge mismatch. That's my public university question. Private university question is, and maybe this is more for, for, for Chris, um, you know, the, the, the large, wealthy, elite private universities, it seems that they have escaped everything that I would call market discipline. There seems to be very little discipline from consumers who seem to be willing, even you know, parents, sometimes they'll, they'll say, yeah, I'm not going to send my kid to Princeton, I'm going to send to Hillsdale. But usually parents are willing to pay for, you know, kids to go to these elite universities almost no matter what. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're also not getting discipline from things like alumni votes, the boards of trustees, they're shutting, you know, Yale shut down that mechanism of having outside uh, candidates for, 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 for the board. So do you see a huge real, sort of, um, you know, realignment of, of private higher ed into uh, institutions, maybe like the University of Austin or other new institutions that are coming along? Or are the, uh, is there any hope for some market discipline to be imposed on these big Private universities. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think it's right, right, that, that it's it's there ultimately is a principal agent problem here and a delegation problem of that you've given a lot of faith and trust in universities and ultimately the faculty to make important decisions um, in the in with a goal of trying to accomplish something for the public good more generally. So I don't think there's in some built-in entrenched right there. It's a question of whether or not they're actually performing the function they should. I think where I would um, uh, have some disagreements though with how you laid it out. Um, is that what, you, what states ought to be thinking about with their universities is not, uh, does the composition of the faculty uh, mirror the composition of the electorate more generally um, uh, because we want some kind of representative uh, structure to universities. The goal of the universities ultimately ought to be, uh, does it advance knowledge? Is it training students in the right way? That may not require, it may not even uh, be useful um, to have um, uh, any kind of clear representation that mirrors uh, what we have in the state uh, more broadly. My concern with these kind of institutions, though, that are 100 uh, liberals to no conservatives on them, is we probably have gone way past the point <laughs> at which um, uh, we're really serving the public good here. Uh, but again, the metric I would want to focus on in saying, why should we be pulling this back, is one of which will create the better social science, which will create better knowledge, and 100 to 1 ratios is not going to do that. Yeah, it, on the private question, I mean, no, there's no, not going to be market discipline because, it, you know, the, the, the kind of high prestige private universities run hedge fund, their hedge fund offices, they have uh, huge uh, you know, capital and income. 
Um, there's a limited supply of, 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 of prestige and social status um, and a you know, country that is now 340 million people. Um, so even if a lot of that status has been kind of burned over time, it's still, look, if your kid gets into Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, uh, even if you're a diehard conservative, most people will say, you got to go, you know, and maybe say a little prayer before they, they head off. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, even my own kids, it's like I, I wouldn't personally be worried uh, uh, too much. I'd be, I'd be very happy. I think the market, dis and then you have student loan subsidies. Obviously, this is a, 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 big, a big flow of cash. I, I think the, the uh, more likely route would be uh, political accountability. And so I would like to see uh, Congress and then a, a new executive. And I've been working on some of these policies with a small team of people uh, in case uh, things change in the next uh, couple years. Um, to have the, the, the DOJ um, uh, launch uh, very aggressive uh, investigation, civil rights investigations into all of our elite universities on grounds of uh, discrimination in admissions, um, uh, looking at all the dirty laundry of all these uh, DEI bureaucracies to find out if they're in violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and could be, could be penalized for some of the ideological materials they're promoting. Um, and then I'd like to see the Department of Education put uh, requirements on qualifications for state funding for open debate, uh, 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 free expression, et cetera. And so those institutions that are really not respecting those values uh, would be penalized or even disqualified from receiving public funds, including research grants. Um, so look, the, 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 the federal money so far, and a lot of the state money, unfortunately, has been in essence a blank check. Um, but I think that the, the people, through their elected representatives, can start putting some conditions on that in order to change the culture within both public and private universities. I would just, um, w one more tool, uh, the IRS. We are a tax-deductible charity, which is not supposed to be political. Uh, one worry, don't forget that anything the state of Florida can do, the state of California can do, too. Uh, so I worry about this uh, political accountability. Uh, in the back, and then Neil. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. I, so I come at this from a perspective of supporting academic freedom, uh, but I am sympathetic to the critique that it's overly based on a procedural rather than a values-based uh, justification. And so I'm curious, first from Keith, if you could, you know, what, what your response would be uh, to the point that you know it's overly proceduralist. And you know, my own view is that part of the value that is underlying defenses of academic freedom is this idea that we have to be open to the possibility that we don't know the answers, right? And that, um, and then I guess, uh, on the other hand, I wonder if there's a danger in coming up with a values-based justification for the university that um, we are sort of telling people the answer in advance um, and not, and overly politicizing, uh, you know, we can say that the university is already politicized, but are we just kind of then reifying the politicization of the university and perpetuating it um, and leaving California to, you know, have one vision of, uh, politics and Texas and Florida another, and then uh, kind of squeezing out those who want to be uh, involved in freedom of inquiry. Um, so I think that the underlying values, substantive set of core that academic freedom is supposed to be serving and the free inquiry is supposed to be serving in general um, is trying to advance us to better understanding, better truth, better understanding the truth, better knowledge of how the world works, both in natural sense and also uh, in a human sense. And that the, ultimately the state, as, as well as Western civilization generally, um, has an interest in knowing what's true and what's false. Um, and universities um, have a role to play in helping us know those things. And that means, for me at least, that there are no sacred cows on that, right? That anything is up for grabs, and anything's open for question. One thing I'm concerned about is if you start um, building in too many substantive values uh, for those things, you're going to say, yeah, but you can't question that. And you can't then uh, critique that. And what's right, one of the concerns about the DEI uh, type stuff that's going on in universities is they've done precisely that. To say, here's a set of political um, sacred cows that we don't want you questioning and critiquing. Universities are all about critiques in general because ultimately we want to know what's right and what's wrong, and ultimately that's going to be helpful to society um, as a whole. Yeah, I, I mean, on, on the political question, I mean, I, I think having universities, a public university system in Florida and Texas that are very different from one another is good. Um, why should they be all the same? We should have competing schools of thought. And if you look at, even back to the, you know, to the, to, to the Greeks, right, the, the kind of origin of our, of our classical liberal arts, um, uh, you know, 
they had kind of, they put up, they set up their little shops, their little schools. You'd walk down to the, you know, you know from, from the hill, from the top of the, of the temple, and, and, and people are debating in the streets. And we have obviously a much bigger society. We don't have, you know, cities of 5,000 people, uh, um, the ideal city size. But um, California's universities should not be the same as in, as in Florida. And unfortunately, to a large extent, they are. Um, this is a problem for Florida much more than it is a problem for California. Uh, and I'd li I would like to see those things to be very different. States compete on a range of different, of, 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 of different uh, qualities and different policies. Uh, public universities should be no different. Neil. Uh, that, thanks for a very good discussion. Uh, Keith used the word skeptical about UATX. And I, I wonder if that's just your general skepticism about life, uh, <laughs> or whether you had a reason for being skeptical about a new University. I'll tell you what I'm skeptical about. I'm very skeptical that Princeton will ever fix itself. Yeah. I'm pretty skeptical that the worst public university in Florida is going to turn out to be the beacon uh, <laughs> for education reform. I really hope you win, you know, but it's kind of, I'm skeptical. Sure. How about you guys? Uh, and the reason that I'm not skeptical about UATX is that I think if you think of Chicago's origins, the solution to the problem is in America is generally a new institution. It'd be kind of odd if we stopped creating universities and just said, oh, these are the universities we have, let's try and make them better. Uh, if you start from scratch, do you realize there are two very obviously broken things about all universities in America, regardless of how they were originally designed? Uh, governance, which you rightly spent some time discussing, and admissions, which mm -hmm. you touched on, but is actually just as important. Governance is something we're completely rethinking at UATX. I spent the weekend in Austin at what you might call the Constitutional Convention. <laughs> I spent three months drawing up a constitution for UATX. Uh, and it's been fascinating because we can learn from the mistakes that seem very widespread. For the sake of brevity, I'll mention just one. In no university that I'm aware of, uh, despite this country's great success with the separation of powers in its own constitution, is there a a judicial branch that can say uh, what you just did, whether it's the president, uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion office, uh, the tenured professors, the students, what you just did is unconstitutional and can't be done. If we had that at Stanford, I think things would go a lot better, mm -hmm. and we would waste a lot less time uh, on uh, what seems to me obviously unconstitutional things that are obviously in violation of the, the university's uh, code on free speech. So we're going to have a judicial branch, and instead of tenure, which has failed as a way of upholding academic freedom, it has utterly failed in its original design. Mm. We are going to have a constitutional protection and a bill of rights that will be upheld by the judicial branch of the university, and that will be far more effective than jobs for life. Um, on admissions, John alluded to me obliquely, Oxford still does admissions that way, and so does Cambridge. Mm. It's, it's terribly onerous, <laughs> but it's also the way that you ensure you don't have duds sitting in front of you for three or four years. And that's also what UATX will do. Now, as we thought about admissions, it became more and more apparent to us that the elite universities have an unbelievably corrupt and dysfunctional system of admissions. It's not transparent, it's opaque, it's almost certainly going to turn out to be illegal. Uh, even on constitutional in some respects. And even more surprising, it, they make almost no use of the kind of data that they could use to find the people who have real academic potential and who we want to have at a university. Uh, I was discussing this with Roland Fryer over the weekend. And Roland had some extremely exciting ideas about how we could do this better in pursuit not of diversity, but of variance. So if the University of Austin reinvents academic freedom and governance and reinvents admissions, it will very quickly exert competitive pressure on the established institutions. Why? Because we'll start getting the better students and that will attract the better faculty. I see no other solution to this problem but new institutions. But Keith, maybe your grounds for skepticism are, are, are ones that I haven't divined. 
No, I think in part I, I am generally skeptical, uh, and so uh, some of this is just generic. Partially, I think there also are a lot of barriers to entry for new universities at this point that just makes it hard to get these things off the ground. I think some of those are not very justifiable, and so they're not appropriate barriers to entry, but they are uh, realities of the situation. Um, I regret that actually I've had scheduling conflicts that prevented me from coming to some of the, of the um, uh, meetings associated with uh, organizing the University of Boston, because I would very much like to um, do that and be participants, because I think ultimately um, we ought to be trying to create new institutions, including entirely new universities. I think that's been healthy um, for American higher education across um, its history, and so I'm totally open to doing more, including partially doing it differently, so that you have different kinds of institutions, see what works, see what doesn't work um, uh, very well. Um, and so um, I think it's a, I, I think it's a genuinely good idea to do these things. Um, I just think that, as is true with lots of new initiatives, uh, failure is probably the more likely outcome than success, um, but I'm hoping for success um, in this case. And I do think relative to market forces, just to note this final point relative to this, you know, would, is there any market force to push at, back against places like Princeton and the like? I think partially creating entirely new institutions will be part of what might do that. But I think also we see a little bit of demonstration there's some uh, market pressure in places like Yale Law School, for example, right? So they have this big blow up, gets a tremendous amount of bad press. Yale is scrambling to how to try to fix the situation. There are probably limits as to how much they actually fix the situation. But it's, but it's indicative that they don't feel themselves completely immune to these pressures. If things would go really south in a very public way, I think even big institutions like Princeton and, and Yale uh, feel it and, and they try to respond. I think it's more of a PR yeah, and yeah. a political pressure. Yeah. And, and I think you have to go and you have to attack people where they're vulnerable and where they care the most. And for elite universities, it's status and prestige. Yep. And so I think that mobilizing the Department of Justice, Department of Education to relentlessly degrade the status and prestige of these institutions until they change is a very good strategy. For UTAX, I mean, I, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. I'm glad to hear these specific details. The problem, as long as we're all skeptical of one another, um, the, 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 the problem though is scale. Um, mm -hmm. in, in, you have, you know, I don't know how many new enrolled kids in college every year, but in, yeah. in, in the state of Florida, it's hundreds of thousands of students. Um, you have 60,000 student public universities, these behemoth institutions. And so what I would say UTAX, obviously as, a, as, a, as an institution, I think it will be successful, I hope it is. But I think the, the influence that it could have is it really a moral influence that then uh, uh, puts a moral pressure on other institutions to change, to say, hey, wait a minute, they're doing it differently, can we change? But without doing what we're doing, without doing what Keith is doing, the scale problem is the, is the real issue. You can have, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 undergraduate students in the next, what, five to 10 years? That's not going to be done enough at scale. Um, uh, uh, smaller, <laughs> OK, yeah. I can give an answer to that. Yeah, please, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely yeah. right. Um, but I mean, every startup is small to begin with. Yeah. Um, and technology allows, uh, uh, unquestionably, uh, ways of scaling higher education that didn't exist before. The mistake that people have made repeatedly over more than a decade is to think you can have a purely virtual institution, which I don't think works. But I think if you use technology to project the content that will be coming out of UATX, then you can scale in ways that obviously you can't scale a physical university. So we are giving a great deal of, of thought to that. But you're right. I mean, I think it's the kind of, there's a propaganda element to this. If we signal that we're doing things in a radically different way and it seems to be cool, that will yes. focus minds. Yes. Because yes. young so people like, are highly susceptible to, to the attraction of coolness. Like yes. Uh, Yvonne, did, could you give us maybe two or three uh, top questions from our yeah. followers on, on the other? So we'll be able to address just a few of them. So the first one is by Harald Kuhl, professor of economics at Chicago. He is asking to both of you should universities stand for academic freedom or also for free speech? Is there a line between the two and where will you draw it? From Daniel Jacobson, professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado. How can we win the battle over the mission of universities when our adversaries blatantly violate the law with impunity? I was a professor at the University of Michigan for 10 years, and despite state law making illegal consideration of race and sex in admission and hiring, every single hiring and admissions committee I was, I was on violated that law. Everyone knew what we were doing and that it was illegal, but they believe it is just. And University of Michigan has very deep pockets, so they have adopted a sumi attitude. In the face of this lawlessness, what else can, can be done except actually to bring the force of law against colleges and universities? Um, 
Give me one more minute. One more. Okay, so this is for Keith. One reason for this is by Stephen Hayward. One reason for the sharp ideological skew of campuses is that deans, department chairs, provosts, etc., get relentless pressure from the left and almost none from the right. So, proposition diversity of opinion and tolerance for non conforming views won't change until universities get some serious pressure from the right, yes. i.e., Governor, uh, Governor DeSantis. Even if these measures have substantive flaws, absent serious pushback of this kind, is there any reason to think colleges will ever divert from the present course? And thus, shouldn't everyone rightly disgusted with the campus climate today line up behind him? Or in other words, will the college campus change if it isn't hit in the head with a two by four? So you guys can read my handwriting? Those yeah. are the questions. If you can remember them, go yeah, for it. Right. Let's give some brief answers and, and try to get some more voices in. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I, I mean, I think all of these questions, again, boil down to the political nature of the university. Where do you draw the line on free speech? How do you punish illegal behavior? Um, and then the third one is how do you put political pressure on administrators to, to go beyond uh, the kind of procedural or ephemeral fanfare um, towards substantive uh, uh, diversity of faculties and opinions. Um, and, and I think, again, the, the, the political right um, has failed to engage on all of these questions. Um, we have failed to put the requisite uh, legal, political, financial, and, and communications pressure. Um, and I agree, certainly, look, we have to recognize that in practical politics, uh, a bill that is decided upon by 150 state legislators from all over uh, the state or all over a country is not going to be as it would a, 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 an ideal form as it would be if maybe all of us sat down and, and designed it. But you have to make a prudent decision. Um, is this going to move us towards a better system? And I think in all the cases, it's yes. And look, not all of these bills in all these states are ones that I would write. They unfortunately don't take my model legislation that I've released uh, wholesale. Um, but I'm going to fight very hard for them, even if some of them have imperfections, because that's how politics works in a practical sense. And I'd just say, let's not let um, uh, 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 the, the, the perfect be the enemy of the good here. Um, and, and it's not like we have such great uh, power, authority, and control that we, can, uh, that we can punt on these issues. We have to take action. Um, and, and I think that's how we have to be oriented. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think it is true. Universities are now reaping the whirlwind. And, um, and to some degree, they've, they deserve it and have earned it. And, um, and I think some of that political pressure uh, will, in some occasions at least, be helpful and will lead universities to reform themselves internally um, in useful ways. And so um, part of my concern is um, how can you uh, make the best of that opportunity uh, to try to get universities to improve themselves uh, while also avoiding some of the worst of these uh, proposals um, they are com coming from the outside that I think will uh, make the situation worse um, in the long term, although worse in different ways uh, than it is uh, now. Um, is it the, on the first question, though, relative to free speech and academic freedom, it's complicated and so too long to talk about it very briefly. I will just note, I think there are differences between the two. I think academic freedom is really essential to universities. I think free speech actually is potentially more expendable um, to universities for interesting ways, because I think they're not as coherent uh, with the core scholarly mission. Uh, but there's some good reasons to want to protect free speech, um, too. Um, and if you want to know more about that, buy my book, uh, Speak Freely, which in part talks <laughs> about exactly those issues. Well done. Uh, Jeff, you had one, and then we'll tee up some more from the. Uh... Yeah. So, I just had a very specific question for Keith on uh, faculty hiring. Uh, many departments today have an unspoken but very clear and very restrictive political litmus test for hiring. Yeah. If you say the wrong thing on a wide range of issues, if you research the wrong, uh, if you reach the wrong conclusions in your research, if you even ask the wrong research yeah. questions, on really important questions, you will not be hired. This seems to be a first order failure of faculty governance. Um, want to know, uh, how do you suggest addressing this without any, you know, if, if you think hiring should be done only within uh, and by faculty? And that, that also leads to the question we didn't really get to from uh, yes. the internet, the flat out illegal behavior uh, on hiring yeah, yeah. That, I was about to say that. I think those two things are related ultimately, and so I think some of these um, 
proposals to try to address this problem are going to fall victim to the same kinds of concerns um, that the second question pointed out relative to race and admissions, for example. Um, I think universities will be very aggressive about how to circumvent um, uh, some of this stuff, and in part, a lot of their decisions they make are not very transparent, and so it's really hard um, uh, to um, avoid them uh, circumventing it, uh, given their um, desires to do so. Um, I think the kind of uh, political orthodoxy enforcement um, in faculty hiring um, as, and I should say as well, I think graduate admissions um, is yeah. a serious problem and has real consequences for what the pipeline looks like of potential people um, to be hired in academia. I think it's a long-term uh, challenge to how to fix that. I think some of it's a function of um, direct discrimination. I think it's not entirely clear how much of it's strictly a function of that. Some of it's other things, including um, of what, to borrow from other contexts, creating hostile environments within a uh, university so that conservatives, students who might be interested in academia, uh, might be smart enough and engaged enough to want to pursue ideas, realize this is not a healthy environment for them to be in. I better go do something else with my life uh, rather than beat my head against that particular wall. But, um, but, and that's a hard cultural change. But to I'm make. a bit astonished, yeah. though, ha having seen the problem, it's documented, everyone knows the mm -hmm. problem. Why would you trust the same people who created right. the problem to fix the problem? That seems to be naive beyond yeah, belief, yeah. and you have to have a different locus yeah. of authority. And then, and, and I know you don't like trustees, I know you don't like right. these people, administrators, but someone ultimately has to make the decision. Why would we trust a child who has spilled all over his room, you know, to then, do, you know, you, you yeah, just say, yeah. no, we're going to take away the toy, um, and then, you know, the, the adults are going to come make, make the decisions. Yeah, Yeah. no, I think that's, uh, that's right. I mean, I think faculty have abused the process, and, and there are going to be consequences for them having uh, done that. And I do have... Um, uh, more skepticism about their ability to, to clean that up um, than I wish I had. Um, I'm just also skeptical of a lot of the reforms. I do think that one thing that um, is within but, the authority, uh, is, yeah, you know, yeah. one thing that is, I think within the authority um, of uh, universities, including board of trustees, that I think can be quite effective is exactly what uh, y'all did at New College first thing, which is to replace the president, put somebody on board uh, that you think um, understands uh, the mission that you want to accomplish um, and has enough um, insight and activity into how the university operates um, in order to try to guide it. I think it's very hard uh, to uh, do this stuff through legislation um, or even through boards of trustees. I think ultimately you got to uh, focus on university presidents and provosts um, who are in the weeds of the detailed decisions that get made every day in yes. academia. And I think ultimately that would be consequential. I'm, I'm sorry, the tyranny of the clock yeah. uh, has yes. randomly assigned the last word to Keith. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming. This was wonderful. And uh, look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you.